Did some of you see the movie, um, The uh, Secret Life of Walter Mitty? Uh, Ben Stiller. That's actually a short story that was written by James Thurber, a a famous author. Back in the 30s, it was uh, run in a magazine, and um, it was one of his most popular stories. But it's a story about an ineffectual person, an ineffective person who spends more time in heroic daydreams than paying attention to the real world. And um, more seriously, I guess the person could intentionally attempt to mislead or convince others that he's something he's not. But there's a great lesson to learn uh, from that story and and not just uh, dreaming about it, but doing it. A couple years ago, I was driving in that after work traffic in LA and it was raining, which makes it twice as bad as uh, more than the normal bad. And um, you know, it's just people having problems and going slow and and it's like people's nerves gets gets revved up. So I was uh, stopped at a traffic light and it was taking a long time. Um, So two cars ahead of me, the first car at the light was having engine trouble. And so then two cars behind me, this guy is honking his horn, like incessantly, rudely. I'm, I'm like, it was so frustrating. I'm just thinking, what are, you, what are you doing here? So I got out of my car, and I went back to the man, and I said, um, I will sit here and honk your horn for you if you would like to go help the woman start her car in the front of the line. And then I woke from my daydream, and (laughs) what I actually did was look in the rearview mirror and roll my eyes and go, some people. (laughs) We might have great faith in our head, but in real life, not so great. We might have great patience in our mind, but perhaps not in our life. And that's the challenge of following Christ, is that Jesus wants us to not only take actions that demonstrate our trust in Him, our belief in Him, but uh, that it comes from our heart. And in one group of people, he said, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. We are in a teaching series that we're, that's called living the blessed life. And today, I want to talk to you about the significance of generosity. Now, many people don't really believe that generosity is a spiritual quality. And um, I want to talk to you about that so that you can see the significance of this important quality in our life, generosity. You know, Jesus saw a woman coming to temple, and when they came to the offering boxes at the door, she put in two pennies, two mites, the Bible says, but it would be like two pennies. And he points out to his disciples that this woman was more generous than those who might be more affluent and have actually given more money because she gave all that she had. In other words, it meant something. And... um, that how, what we give, how we give it, how our heart is in it matters to Jesus that he stopped and taught us a lesson. And uh, so one of our core values here at Oasis is um, generosity. And you know, in our core values, we have a list and it involves compassion and integrity and, and, um, and generosity is one of them. And you might think, well, why is generosity one of the core values? And I believe it is a core uh, part of our heart that allows so much more of God's provision and experience in our life when we are generous. It's just like uh, persistence or steadfastness, you know, that term, persistence. I mean, that is a hugely important quality because 
Persistence or endurance is the quality that allows all other qualities to grow in our life. Because if we don't have endurance or persistence, we, we give up and we, it doesn't have time to allow patience or love to grow deeply in our heart. Are you following me? All right. Let me hear from you every once in a while. You know, it just helps me know that you're here and that you're with me. And so... Um, uh, one of the scriptures in the book of Proverbs that King Solomon wrote is Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. And it says this, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. The, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Solomon brings to us that which we see throughout the scripture is how we give and it will be given unto us in so many different ways. And it's not just about giving to get, it's giving because we consider it an honor to give and be part of a solution. That's the heart that God wants us to have. And then he blesses us, but it's not a deal we're trying to make with God. If I give this to you, will you um, provide for me the way I need it? But I like how the message version of the Bible tells us, or reads that same scripture in Proverbs. It says this, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. So today we're going to talk about why generosity is important in our life. We're going to talk about why generosity is important to God. Does anybody want to hear that? Yeah. Okay. Anybody here think it's the person next to you really needs to hear this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Why generosity is important to God? Number one, generosity is the core of God's nature. A lot of people uh, throughout the world don't really see God as a generous God. They see him as a vengeful God, a, a legalistic God, a God of criticism and judgment. But the Bible shows us that he is generous. It's not only something he does, it's something that he is. You know, so uh, generosity is the core of God's nature. When Jesus was telling a story that we call the parables in the New Testament, he told the story that is, is one of my favorites because there's so much truth to see in it and, and so many different way, things to gain from it is the story of the prodigal son where uh, a son runs off from his father's uh, land and goes and wastes all of his money and he, he comes back, he realizes, man, living with my dad is so much better than what I'm doing. I could just work for him and be a servant and do better. And so he comes to, to his father, and he comes to say, I'm no longer worthy to, worthy to be called your son, and, uh, but just let me be a servant so I can get something to eat. And the father sees him coming a long way off, and he runs to him and embraces him, and he starts his speech. Oh, father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He, he's like, he doesn't even respond. Come on, let's throw a party, get, get the royal robe, put sandals on his feet, because servants didn't wear sandals and the father wanted to make sure nobody confused him with the servant because he was a son and he put the ring of authority on him and he was generous when he the son didn't deserve it and that's how God treats us he's generous when we don't really even deserve it you know we are aware of this term godliness we we use that a lot and Godliness is, one way to understand it, is God-likeness. So that when we are more and more like God, we treat people with love, we have faith, we have patience, we, we're getting those qualities. That's godliness. So godliness is also generosity. Generosity is a, a, an act of godliness. And it requires generous soul to focus on others and not ourselves. Anybody understand that one? It requires generosity to have a great marriage. Yeah, it, great marriages don't work when he said, yesterday was your turn, now it's my turn. It's more like, this month was your turn. 
And let's do it again if you want to. Uh, and uh, it requires generosity to serve, to love. It requires generosity to forgive. Because we're giving where somebody else is taken. But instead of responding in kind, we take a step higher and we are generous with our forgiveness, generous with our love. And that's the, the spirit of generosity. In James chapter 1, verse 5, James tells us this. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now, um, this is in the NIV or the New International ver Version. And um, you could interpret that God gives wisdom generously to everybody who asks for it. How I see it is that he's saying, hey, God gives generously to all people. So imagine what he would do with wisdom. So if you're going to ask for wisdom or you're going to ask for guidance or you're going to ask for peace, he gives generously. So don't think you're not going to get wisdom. And some of you might think, well, how come I prayed for wisdom and I've done all those stupid things? It's a mystery. We'll find out in heaven, I guess. Now, look at Titus. Titus is a small little book at the end of the New Testament. Um, you should turn to this chapter. This, this is a good one to look up right now. Titus chapter 3. And, of course, we have them on your screens, but it would be great to have you look. But Titus chapter 3 and verse, verse 5 says this. He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, and giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. There's another example of generosity. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, he says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you could be made rich. He said, you know the generous grace that he gives to us. Because that's how God is. He can't help it to be, but to be generous. And um, so he has so willing to be generous toward us, he gave up his majestic position in heaven so that he could come and pay the price for failure and sin to ensure that we would have access to God's generosity. Isn't that good? Uh, second, uh, the second reason that we, uh, generosity is important to God is because generosity pleases God because it's a demonstration of his grace. Generosity demonstrates that we recognize that God is our source. Yeah, sure, you might have a business or you might have an employer or you might have an inheritance, but people who, who really trust God and know his generosity, we, we know it comes from him. It might come through an employer, it might come a different way, but it comes from him. And um, so God is our source. And in Proverbs 22, 9, it tells us that the generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. And, and so uh, when you realize that God has provided, and so we want to be a blessing to others, and you help somebody who's poor, you help somebody who's hungry, you give to them because you're generous. And then uh, God says, oh, I see this person, I can get something through them. So I will get something to them because it's so hard to find somebody like that. Because too many people look at the homeless guy and he's probably going to use, use it to buy beer. Well, maybe, but he has to eat, but it's not up to you to figure out what he's going to do with it. Of course he's going to misuse it. That's why he's in the position he's in. But we're not going to go, you know, hey, you know, show me, you know, some good skills and then I'll bless you. No, you just love people. You just bless them and try to help them. And we find all kinds of reasons not to be generous. And not only, it's not only for others that we're generous, but also for you it's important that we are generous. Because we see in Acts chapter 10, there's a story right in, in the beginning where Cornelius, 
a Roman, not a, a Jewish man, but he's praying. And um, it says in Acts chapter 10, one day at about three o'clock in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear and said, what is it, Lord? And the angel answered, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Do you see that? Your prayer, your worship, your generosity, your giving, it made you stand out. And it came up as a memorial before God. And he said, I can trust that person. I can use that person. And so he, he told, gave him direction, now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. And what this was, was a message that allows you and I to be followers of Jesus because it was a message only to the Jews at that point. But through this revelation, he said, no, everybody can be saved. Gentiles, Californians, <laughs> Americans, everybody. And so um, this was an important message to get across. And then one more scripture here, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 5 in the New Living Translation. He says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Hallelujah. That's good. Yeah. She's going to be enriched. The rest of you can watch. <laughs> okay. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> And so, uh, and when we take our gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. Do you see that? Through our generosity, people will thank God for what you do. And so two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. Generosity signifies our complete surrender to God, that we trust him. As followers of Jesus, really, we give our life to him. He owns it all. You know, if we've given it to him, it's his. If he's our provider, if he provided it for us and we didn't have it before he had it, then he gave it to us. It's all his. So we want to be good stewards, uh, of, good managers of what he's given to us. And so, uh, you know, in this teaching that we've uh, been through, we've learned clearly that the Bible teaches that the tithe is a holy thing that belongs to God and that we give that to him because it belongs to him and then we express our generosity out of offerings or other giving. This week, I had lunch with a friend whose name is J. John. He's a pretty well-known speaker and author. He lives in England. And so he and his wife and Holly and I had lunch. And he tells a story about a man that we'll call James. I just picked that name out of the air. But James is at the airport, and he's waiting to catch his flight. And so he's got a little time, and he's going to, he decided, I want to get one of those bags of those small donuts and a coffee. And so he buys his donuts and his coffee, and he comes out to the seating area, and it's packed. There's hardly any place to sit. So he finds a spot that's at a table across from another man. So he, he sits down, and he puts down his briefcase, and he puts down his coat, and, and uh, begins, sits down, has some coffee, and then he reaches over and uh, eats one of the small donuts. And so in a minute, the man sitting across from him reaches over to the bag of donuts and pulls one out and eats a donut and smiles at him. And he's like, what the heck, who is this guy? The nerve of somebody to just eat my donut, I can't even believe. And, and then he's like, well, he might be emotionally unstable, so I don't wanna call him out on it because he might just go off on me or something, so I'm just not gonna say anything and let that pass. So then James takes another donut, eats it, and then moves the bag closer to his coffee. And so while he's sipping his coffee and eating his donut, the guy reaches over and takes another donut out of the bag and he eats it. And he said, this guy, he's done it twice now. I mean, this guy is crazy. Who in the world would just take that liberty and just think, I'll just have one of these donuts. And he's just thinking, man, this, this guy is out of his mind or he's weird or something. And so uh, then, the man gets up to go to his flight. 
And so he gets his coat and belongings together, and there's one donut left in the bag. So he takes the donut out, breaks it in half, puts half in his mouth, the other half on the bag, and scoots it over to James, and then smiles as he walks off. And so James is thinking, good, I'm glad you're out of here, you donut thief. And uh, if you think I'm going to take a bite of that, you're crazy because you probably have some kind of infection that I want to get. And he just couldn't believe that the, he had this experience. And, and so then he realized, well, it's time for my flight. I got to get going. And so he uh, finishes up his coffee. He reaches down and gets his coat. And on top of his bag is his bag of groceries. I mean, his bag of donuts. So he thought the man was stealing his donuts, but the man was sharing his donuts. And so what we have to realize is that God owns all the donuts. He's not taking anything from us. He's sharing it with us. Every time we get a paycheck, we get a little bag of donuts. We got 10 donuts. And God says, take one of the donuts, give it to the local church. And so that's called the tithe. So we give it. And then he tells us to use the other nine wisely. But some of you have had this experience where you have the 10 donuts, you give one, and then now you've got nine, but what you need is 11. And you think, what did I just do? I had 10, I just needed one more, now I gave that away, now I need two more. And you know what the amazing thing, that you talk to anybody who is a tither, who honors God with this first part of their income, and they'll tell you, somehow God causes the nine to become 12, and you get what you need done. That's the benefit of having God's provision and God's protection in your life. I can't believe I just blew that whole story by saying groceries. Jeez. I was, I was going to try my English accent the way J. John tells it, but all my accents turn out to sound Latino. So I try African, I try English, and it, at the end of the sentence it's like, is this for Spanish-speaking people in Africa? Or? But see, this points out that a lot of Christians have never heard the Sermon on the Amount. We, we are so tight and so stingy. We're squeezing the dollar bill so hard because we don't trust. We're, we're giving George Washington a headache. We're holding on so tight. And God is saying, be generous. Love people. Give. So, some of us have, uh, you might have 10 donuts and you give one to the church and, and you have that nine. And, uh, but there's a lot of people who don't need nine. They need seven because what those donuts represent to them in, in amount. And so, I realize a, a lot of people, maybe most, are find themselves in that, I need 11, I'm at nine. But then God will speak to you and lead you to the, the person who doesn't need the whole nine. He will lead you. Well, why don't you take some of what you have and support an organization? Watoto Ministries. You know, Joyce Meyer. Send one of those donuts to her. Not literally, but send one of those to her. You know, give it to God chicks. Or, you know, you take something other than that and, and you give it as an expression of generosity, and you will see that God demonstrates his love and his generosity. Generosity demonstrates the grace of God, and it blesses others. We, we give to others and to circumstances and situations. We give to people because we've been given so much. And we know that generosity is an expression of God's grace. And, and when people want to know, then they, we get a chance to let them know um, why we have taken on this generous life. I was told that somebody 
a young boy in our children's ministry, our kids' ministry, had some coins that he had saved up. He had like 96 cents. And when you're a young kid, every coin matters. You know, he had it in this piggy bank. And uh, so one day he comes home and he counts the chain, the money in his piggy bank, and he realizes there's 50 cents missing. And so he's asking, and he has an older sister, and she admits that she took the 50 cents because she had a book that was overdue at the school library, and uh, she had to pay a fine, and she didn't want the mom to know. And so he, she said, I'm sorry, I, I took it. And he goes, that's okay, I forgive you. And she, she said, you forgive me? I thought you were going to be angry and mad. Why, why do you forgive me? He goes, you know, the grace of God. And here, why don't you have, and he gave her one of his special toys to her. And then I thought, out of a child, here's somebody who gets it already, that God can take care of me. I don't need to worry about every little thing. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 9, 11 says, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. When Jesus got a hold of a man named Zacchaeus in the New Testament, he was a man who made his living stealing from people. He was a tax collector, and they had the ability to add a, an additional amount on their real taxes, and they kept it for themselves. Everybody knew it, and uh, there's nothing they could do about it, but Jesus went to his house and talked to him and had an impact on him that changed him, changed his heart. And then he responds uh, to Jesus, you know what? If I've taken anything from anybody, I'm going to give, uh, give it back plus uh, additional money. I'm going to restore, you know, a multiplied amounts of money to people that I've taken. Somehow he went from a taker to a giver, which what happens to us when we really allow the reality of God, his grace, his generosity to capture our soul. You know, Elijah, the famous prophet, one of the greatest prophets in the Bible, um, he had uh, defeated a uh, an army of God's enemies, and God led him to go out in the wilderness. And he said, I'll take care of you. And he said, and so he fed him. The ravens would fly and uh, drop food off to him, and there was water flowing freely, so he had all that he needs. I think you'd have to have faith to eat something that came from a raven's claw, but that's another story. And, um, but then God said to him, hey, uh, I want you to go to this other place called Zarephath. And he dried up the water, and he, the ravens stopped coming, and he went to Zarephath. And he said, you're going to see a widow there, and uh, she's going to help you, and, and you're going to help her. So he, he comes to her, and she says, you know, I have nothing. I only have something left for uh, a piece of bread, you know, uh, for my son and I. We're going to eat it, and then that's all we got. And Elijah said, well, you should do that. But here's what I'm going to tell you. First, uh, bake a little and give it to me. And then have the first fruit, you know. And then uh, prepare for yourself. And if you do that, your vessels will never run dry, just like the water in the stream and the ravens coming. And so she responded. And most of us would think, if we saw a person like that, we would think, oh, well, by all means, you need to have this and don't worry about me. But God didn't send Elijah to get something from the widow. God sent God, uh, uh, Elijah to get something to the widow to provide for her. And so he showed her how to tap in to this amazing provision of God. And um, so I have to wrap this message up and... Um, I guess I would close by saying why generosity is so important to God is one, generosity is core, is the core of God's nature. Two, generosity pleases God because it's a demonstration of his get, uh, grace. And number three, generosity requires a pure heart within us. You know, it's a journey. 
It's a journey that we have to go on learning to trust God, learning to yield to his word. And one of the biggest hindrances to generosity is just our own mindset, our own frame of life. And uh, we all have different experiences with finances and different ways that we were brought up. But, um, you know, I I was brought up having very little and and having to earn as much. And my mom would just be very careful about how much went out. And I was always, you know, the typical teenager, ungrateful. I had no idea. It never occurred to me that a, a single mom raising three teenagers working as a receptionist Uh, wouldn't have money. But now, you know, after I grew up, I was thinking, man, what a jerk I was. (laughs) I mean, because she had to work hard to get that done. And, um, but, you know, our life was like, uh, I I was telling people the other day that we put coffee in a little um, single cone and we pour hot water through it, and that's how we make our coffee. But the other day, I spilt some of the coffee grinds, and I'm like brushing it off into my hand because I don't want to lose my coffee grounds, you know, because it was like at least like a spoonful or two. And I'm scraping it off, and I'm just thinking, what am I doing? You know, do I, you know, is this how I see things? I, I remember moving out to Los Angeles, and um, how I bought clothes was I found what was the cheapest shirt, and I bought that one. Not the one that I liked the most, or not the one that was the one I really wanted, just whichever was cheaper. And to make matters worse, I would drive seven or eight miles to get a cheaper one and spend the money on gas instead of just the shirt. But when your uh, head is like that, you don't see reasonably. And, um, and then, when, you know, I lived in Southern California for years, so. We went to Disneyland back in the day when um, you had to pay a certain amount and tickets for different rides and everything. But, but we, my dad and my mom, we, we had to get there first thing in the morning. We had to stay till the very last minute because we wanted to get all our money's worth. I mean, forget about if we're half asleep or cranky or anything. You gotta stay. We paid a lot for these tickets. And I don't know, maybe you've had some experiences like that, but that's how God can renew our mind so that we don't see ourselves as somebody living life with the potential threat of not having enough to be a conduit of God's blessing to others. We are blessed to be a blessing, learning to trust our Father and give uh, in life generously. And remember, it's generosity in your marriage that makes it flourish. It's generosity in your business that makes it succeed. It's generosity in your faith. It's generosity in how you serve somebody and and how you treat others. Generosity affects so many things in our life. It's a godly quality. So I want to challenge you to remember this week when you're going to work on Monday or Tuesday because it's a holiday. But when you're going to work, to remember that generosity is a core of God's nature. Remember that generosity is a way to bless others. And often I've had to remind myself, I come down to this moment of what should, how should I respond to this situation? And if you don't know what to do, uh, I lean toward the generosity solution. So somebody isn't behaving properly and, you know, it's a bad transition in the relationship. I just feel like if I'm not sure what to do, it's 50-50. I'll just go ahead and lean toward the generous side. And so I just bless them and give them grace and leave it alone. Or if, if I see a person who has need, you know that situation where you're there walking into a store and this guy goes, hey, can you give me a dollar for food? And I'm like, Okay, I give to a lot of homeless organizations. And, we'll, and I'm looking to see if I, and I'm smelling to see if I smell alcohol. And it's like, all right, it's, it's awkward, but you know what? I'm just going to lean toward generosity. Just give them something to eat. And uh, that's just made a big difference in my life. And I just encourage you to trust God with that kind of heart. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your generous grace. And I pray that each one of us will 
begin to see the significance of generosity in our life as we follow Jesus, as we follow him as our Lord, as the leader of our life. I pray that you will show us how to have that generous heart. The world of the generous gets larger and larger.